Oh, I've been waiting all weekend for oh. this one. <laughs> all weekend. Because it's November 8th, text folks. you sent me. Yeah, I did say I was going to rant today, so we'll see if I still got that rant in me. It's November 8th, people, 2021. Welcome aboard, folks. This is the Crushing Iron Podcast. We are episode 528. Okay. I've been on it recently with at least not like going over a pre-show. 528, so it is a... <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 but listen, set the bar low, go high. Okay, that's what we've always done, and we've, we seem to do a pretty good job of it. Hope you have an uh, awesome start to your week and had a fantabulous weekend, unless you found yourself in the washing machine and may still be there. That was Iron Man Florida this weekend. We have a lot to go over with that one. We'll get into that shortly, but it is a, it's a beautiful, sunshiny, crisp day. It mm. actually feels like winter, and I'm digging it. I have forgotten how much I love running in the winter, um, and it's a great time of year. Get your run on. Uh, if it's your first time tuning in, welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. You know, you have a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general, and that your time is valuable, so we appreciate you giving us uh, that time today. We cover it all. We do uh, swim, bike, and run detailed podcasts, like our popular Mini series, micro goals that we uh, did uh, last month. <laughs> if you can even call it a mini series, um, we'll do uh, race recaps. Micro yes, uh, micro goals and micro series. We'll do uh, we do race recaps. We do race previews. Uh, oftentimes, we'll hop into our Facebook group, which we did last week, and do a little Q and A. We did part one of that on uh, last Thursday, and we were going to do do that today, but we're going to push that to Thursday, just given uh, what seemed like the craziness of Ironman Florida. We're going to start uh, riffing on that and see how far we get. Uh, we'll cover it all, but that's an awesome community. <clears throat> Again, on Facebook, if you want to be a part of it, search Crushing Iron Group. Answer one simple question. We'll let you write in. Uh, Mike and I, as, as both best, uh, best friends, athletes, coaches, we use our uh, own experiences in life and in training to talk through sometimes. Obviously, we work with a, a wide range of athletes across the globe, from beginners to elite level amateurs. Uh, so we, we use the, uh, well, sometimes we use Training Peaks comments as a way to uh, <laughs> launch a good discussion. Uh, and I had one of those t- today, too, so we have that as a backup. Uh, but that's it. We have, uh, we have no sponsors. We have no ads. We have one agenda. And th- that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned something again that we work with people from all over. I, I think all we need over. to reiterate. So sometimes I get that Even question. Alabama. You guys work with people out of state. And I'm like, yeah. That's, that's all we do. Yeah, that's, pretty much. That's literally all we do. Our 95% of our entire roster between all five coaches live outside of the state of the coach that they work with. Mm. And definitely ours. Yeah, and that's just kind of how it started to happen, and that's how it is. So if you, you're interested in coaching, check out the coaching tab at c26triathlon.com. Dot. Um, yeah, hop in there and then. Hop oh, in the new club, new club. club. We had a lot of there. people, a lot of action on that this weekend. So hop in and be a part of that. But yeah, just there's a lot of new stuff on the website. So check it out. We're offering a lot of things this coming year uh, that we did last year and improve some things we've done before. So uh, definitely go to the website c26triathlon.com and check out the coaching tab. Check out camps. Check out hub visits, town home. Uh, we got a lot going on, um, and there was a lot. First off, Tennessee balls, baby. Ah, uh, here it goes. People, this is where they skip ahead. They this is where me. they skip ahead. I was going to give I'm a little gonna, shot. I was say, we always own Kentucky, even on the basketball court. That's just how, how it's been the last five years. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Uh, no, I stayed up late. And I made a, a egregious error because I stayed up late to watch it. The latest I've stayed up in years to watch anything. Um, and totally forgot about the, the, the whole clock thing. That's also the biggest sham. Um, the whole fallback thing. Because when you have a kid, it's, br- it's, it's brutal. Mm. Because they don't know. The Hayden was up at like four o'clock. <laughs> uh, it just gives you a whole extra hour to like parents. It's really unreal. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's Tennessee not fair balls. for parents, but for me. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. It's you, right you in the sweet dig spot. It right but. in the sweet spot. Uh, we got run camp this week, so that'll be great. But no, so this weekend was was obviously was Ironman Florida. Um, wait, wait, wait. What? what about the Badgers are back too? Oh my God. You got like. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, you guys are usually good though. We suck for it. We have sucked for like the last eight years. No, but I had a, I had a taste from for maybe starting to really suck at the beginning of the year. Yeah, no. you did. You got a little and taste of what I've been living uh, through. Yeah, right. A little bit. Yeah, and well, now we, you're appreciating we, you know it more. We held the course and turned it around. We I mean, panic. But, we didn't well, fire our coach. It's not. It's not that you guys really had to panic either. It's that everyone. No offense, but everyone overrates the teams in your conference every year. Hundred percent. Iowa number two. Are you like serious? Are you kidding right now? They're going to end up in like the Citrus Bowl in like the uh, Tallahassee County or something. No one ever heard of playing like a some kind of a tech or an A and M from Louisiana. 
uh, in Michigan State. I'm sorry. They beat Michigan, which is like another egregiously overrated college football <laughs> team every single year because they have Jim Harbaugh. They're sponsored by Nike and have like, you know, Jordan stuff on their unis, way overrated. So Michigan State barely beats them. Like, oh, definitely number two in the country. And they get to Purdue, okay, the Boilermakers, okay? It's just, it's unreal. Then you got Penn State, who's like, oh, they got James Franklin, who isn't, who, honestly, who likes James Franklin? Seriously, no <laughs> one. Um, they go seven <laughs> overtimes in the worst football I've ever watched in my entire life, and they're still somehow ranked like the top 25. It's the most overrated conference in the country every single year. Except outside of Wisconsin. They're at least dependable. We're dependable. We'll go they're to the bowl de- game and stand up against just about anybody. Yeah, they're dependable. Um, like, we're dependable to show up twice a week because we always have for five plus years. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, you're you, talking about you Florida? Come to Florida. And listen, like... Speaking of Florida's football, go ahead. Uh, no, we can we can definitely go on that. I mean, see you later, Gators. Like, <laughs> see you later, alligator. <laughs> the you guys are having the worst team. I love Florida. It. Hey, they're, they're just like your they're number anyway. one arch nemesis. Yeah. Every Tennessee fan I meet like, says... I don't care what happens. Honestly, I don't care if we lose as long as Florida loses. It's more like that. I'm like, yeah, that's wow. kind of true. They're headed way down. Um, yeah. But no, I remember Florida. I mean, sure, if you're even like, you can like follow at least even at a minimum. There was a decent professional field. He had Liner Sanders, Gustav Eden made his, his first Ironman appearance at that level. And good God, like he just put on an unreal display running a 234 I think marathon off the bike in a swim like it is it was unreal uh it was a pretty decent field so that, that got a little bit of a hoopla because they got transferred from Ironman California that was canceled but Florida is generally seen as you know a late season fast PR course that's how it's labeled okay that's how it's it's advertised that's how it's marketed um and, and I honestly like we had we, we both had athletes doing it had a bunch of friends doing it I always kind of have this, my anxiety as a coach is always a little bit higher as the long, the longer the season goes, because I tend to think people take their guards down early. Like they think they've been training all year and, and you hop into a race and like, I've been training all year. Or what happens for a lot of people I think they just start procrastinating. training. Like they're like, ah, it's a late season race. I've got plenty of time. And all of a sudden you let yourself fall by the wayside and you, and you wake up and it's August and you got to get your crap together for October. But the coverage started on Ironman Live at, for the pros at like 7.25, 7.30 my time. They weren't swimming for more than five minutes. So I looked over at Coach Hayden. We were sitting on the couch. And I said, dude, th- th- thumbs up. They aren't, they're swimming nowhere. And, of course, he was like, yes, they are. They, they're moving their arms. I was like, no, like they're not going anywhere. It looked slow out of the gate. It, it did. It, and, you, and if you follow like professional racing, there's always – a pack, but it always like dissipates quickly because the speed, like it stayed to get the front eight stayed together the entire time. They were looking back. They were like, tell they, when they came around they, and they went off course after the first, was like, something's up. So, something is not, something's not right. It didn't look super choppy to, to start, but it looked, it looked like one of those, you know, again, Ocean swims are unpredictable, right? Like, and even if you look at the weather, it was cold to start, right? Like, mm-hmm. at least Galagos, who who was one of our one of our friends, she was on the podium and and got her Kona slot. She was joking this morning. She was like, you know, Ironman athletes, you know, spend thousands of dollars in their kits and their gear and their tech, and they end up looking like homeless people on the bike because they got like sweatshirts and like glove, like, uh, Walmart gloves, like you know, yeah. on the bike, like doing this thing because it was cold. It was windy. It was not an easy day at all by any stretch. And we, we had an athlete that came out of the water who was a big time swimmer, at least two, like, and they were off the bat about maybe 10 minutes slower in the first loop than I anticipated. And I just kind of thought, oh, this is not good. Um, and then you saw more and more athletes come through, both that we coach and both that I know. And when they came around for the second loop, I was like, something's up. Something, something ain't right. And they weren't doing a lot of coverage of like the like the age group swim, mm-hmm. um, just the professionals. But when I saw one of the athletes come out, it was at least, it was about 20 to 25 minutes slower than a, than a regular time. And for a point of reference, I mentioned this in, in the weekly email we do for our team, is the first pro out of the water had the exact same swim time as I did my, my very first Ironman of Florida. Uh, when I obviously isn't like what in near enough like shape that these same time. That's how slow and we've come to find out long it was. There are I mean obviously a lot of this is, is rumors, but I, I mean 
rumor is usually from one or two people. This is from basically every single person I've talked to and looking at the data and the watch uh, from uploads and training peaks, we have, we've had anywhere from 5,300 yards to 6,000. And from what I understand, the buoys were set the day before they were, they then drifted, uh, making the course longer, but then there also multiple people said whatever you whatever kind of current or chop you want to call it doesn't matter that there were large chunks of time where they were felt like they were just swimming in space and not going anywhere Mm -hmm. so you take that and you combine it with most athletes under prepare wildly for the swim and can i let me just say this are you going right now yep i'm going in am i good that's fine that's when i just kick yeah yeah Rolling starts are the most effing ridiculous thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. And this Whoa. is the, like, this is the, this is the perfect race to highlight how absolutely god awful the, the start that rolling starts are safer for athletes in a two loop swim. You let pros go out. So you have the faster athletes going around. Most of them finish their first loop. Okay. And come in and are swimming now on top of in or around slower swimmers. You can't tell me that that is safer for both the faster athletes and the slower athletes. Faster athletes, do you want to have to swim around people and try to get kicked in the face? Nope. That's why they have rolling starts. But not to do some rolling starts are irrelevant. Slower swimmers, don't you start in the back for a reason? Yeah, we don't want to get swum over. We don't get, want to get swum over. We want to have plenty of time, plenty of space. How did you feel, right? Already swimming in a current, already swimming in a washing machine. And I can't, and honestly, I can't imagine from a kayak, you know, rescue support scenario, trying to dictate and figure out who needed help and who didn't when you see people going fast and people going slow and people going nowhere. You can't tell me it's safer. It's the biggest load of crap. And I, 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 will, I would argue, and I, and I am, that a mass start would have made things significantly safer to do. They would have had athletes in the water in less than 10 minutes. The way they used to do the Ironman Panama City is you basically got in this huge line on the beach, you stand out, every single person was in the water within 10 minutes. Every single person. That would have given everybody adequate time to probably finish, and it would have given... It wouldn't have stretched out because the, the other thing with rolling starts is, oh, well, you know, we try to c- condense in, in uh, you know, the amount of coverage we have. You're still covering 1.2 miles. You don't have to cover that when everyone's in the water with 10 minutes. You basically have to just slowly herd, you know, as like a shepherd, you know, 2,000, 3,000 swimmers. But they're all gonna, they're only going to take up like half a mile because they're not going to be that spread out. And then what you also have is you can you can basically figure out, all right, well, I've got the faster swimmers up front, so we don't probably don't need that much support for people in the front. Obviously, people in the front can still have panic attacks, you can still have anxiety, you can still get problematic, but you don't need to allocate as many kayaks and self-supports, jet skis, boats, whatever, for probably the people who are towards the front. They're probably up front for the reason. You can allocate more of those people towards the back, towards the people who probably need it. You can't do that with a two a two loop rolling start swim. You can't do it because everyone is spread out over one point two miles. It, it's just idiotic. It really is idiotic. You can't you can't tell me that it's safer. You can't tell me anything. It's oh well. It allows athletes to get in the water and get comfortable doing their own time. Yeah, for what about thirty seconds until they get blasted through by a swimmer coming for them to either a prof- professional or an elite level male or female swimming 115s while they're barely trying to get by swimming 220s and they're have somebody swimming over their back. No one wants that. And it's not about safety. We've just like regressed in a manner where, oh, well, I, we've had a few, you know, uh, had a few deaths in, in the swimming, which still happen just as regularly, but we're going to change it up to a rolling start because it's safer. And we really want people to feel more welcomed. Well, welcome to Ironman swimming. It sucks and it's hard and it might be long and it might be choppy, but a rolling start does absolutely nothing. In fact, I think it makes it more dangerous on many, many levels. And it also takes a lot of the fun out of the racing when you're because you have no idea where you are. Mm. Wow. That was good. And I mean, you talk about procrastinate training and I think that's kind of what the rolling start gives you, you know, a little bit of like, Oh, I don't need to get ready. It's going to be, you know, easy. I can just pop in, have my own space the whole time and whatever. But even on a full, like if it's not a two loop, think about how spread out that gets. I mean, you know, if you start all together, it's probably still going to end up being spread out 1.2 miles. But if you start the fast swimmers up front and 30 minutes later, you're starting the slow ones, you're going to have the whole distance basically to cover as a, as a support crew, right? Mm-hmm. Now, 
Um, Same know, thing for Wisconsin. That's what I was when just When you thinking. dropped in rolling star at Wisconsin, then you got 70.3 athletes literally catching the back end. Like, stop telling me that it's about, it's, it's about safety. It's not about safety. It's about money. It's about, it's about giving the, the, um, the illusion. facade and the illusion of extra amounts of safety protocols for a swim because it is everyone's, you know, it, not everyone's. It's a lot of people's least favorite one. It's a lot of people's um, one. They're, the one they're the most. You know what's happening more often? More people are getting in bike wrecks or getting hit by cars during races than are happening in the swim. And it's got nothing to do with rolling starts. So stop giving the illusion that the swim start is being made safe because of rolling starts. So would you just sign up? And then what you're going to do, you're probably going to take it easy. You're not going to swim. Oh, it's going to rolling start. I can kind of get it on my own time. I can have my own space. You know, I'm going to have my wetsuit on. Well, I can tell you right now, every single athlete that I know that, that swam at Ironman Florida was like, that was the roughest swim I've ever been in. And if you weren't prepared, you paid the price, right? You literally paid the price either with you gave up 30 extra minutes on your swim. I know another athlete who like usually swims at a 130, they were at the two hour mark. And it, it it probably felt like for a lot of athletes an act of survival, trying to because you've never swam at anything like that before at all. You also had a lot of swimmers who swim a ton, and they were like, "I don't know what the big deal is." I, I, I mean, yeah, it was a little bit hard, but it wasn't what everybody thought it was. Mm. So, st- like Iron Man is doing everyone a absolute disservice by continuing to discount how hard it's the hardest leg, in my opinion. It's the hardest leg. So what they're trying to do is flip it to make it seem and have the illusion that's the easiest and safest like it's not you if you panic and you struggle in the water you, you have you can't just coast on your bike you can't stop at an aid station you can't walk on the run you're treading water a half mile out at sea in the ocean what, who's going to take care of you you maybe can see a kayak in a sea of what night and 500 of their swim caps with flailing arms like Stop telling me that's what, and stop discounting it to, to such an extent that it continues to make people think that they can just go swim 2,000 or 3,000 yards a week in an easy swimming pool as softly and as carefully as they want to, and they're still going to be fine because it's, it's the shortest, it's the shortest distance of, of the race. It doesn't even matter. Tell that to tell 500 plus people who DNF'd at Ironman Florida. Yeah. Uh, that's all I've got for today. Follow us. And say, I no, just don't, you know. I'm uh, to your point, man, I got, uh, you know, uh, I'm coaching more and more people now. And like, this was the first time that I always get a little anxious, but when I rolled over Saturday and, and kind of, I try to time it like at the end of the swim so I can just look the tracker and see how everybody did. And I'm looking and people are still on their or just finishing their first loop. And then now I'm starting like, as a coach, you get kind of, you know, you're anxious, but then I started getting a little nervous to be honest. I mean, it seemed like things were weird. You know, like you're saying, I had people I knew that would probably swim the first loop in maybe 40 minutes, and they were an hour plus. And and then you have people where, you know, that they got they were actually got pulled from the water, but they didn't go over uh, the mat or something. So the timing or the timing just kept going. And I'm just sitting there going, man, this is freaking me out as a coach a little bit. But yeah, I mean, to your point is. Everyone is afraid, you know, that so many people don't get into swimming until late in their lives. And it's usually their biggest piece of anxiety. And it obviously it goes, it normally is that and then the bike or whatever. So, cause it, it's all about safety, right? And feeling safe at what you're doing. And, um, I think you're absolutely right. The people underestimate the work that needs to be put in, in the pool and the hard swimming that you need to do. And it's not, to, it's hard swimming, Everyone kind of thinks that's just all only only about getting fast, but it's it's about getting strong and it's about getting tough. And it's about being able to deal with, you know, that random elbow to the side of the head or whatever, or your ability to get out of a scrum and then be able to be calm afterwards. You know, it's that high, high burst energy, that uh, high heart rate stuff that you got to be able to calm back down because so many people don't practice that. Like you're saying, it's just always kind of like cruise for a couple thousand and go, I could, I got another couple thousand in me. That's the race. I, I'm, I'm going to be fine, but you have to be really, you know, just strong and, and aggressive out in open water and nobody practices that. You you have to be on the offensive and like they even, so Lionel Sanders, who got second overall and is obviously, well, is oftentimes kind of beat up on because of his inability to like hang with the front pack and the swim, he held with the front pack and I was talking to this other buddy. I was like, it was because he had the swim of his life, right? Not the fastest time of his life, but he hung, he hung with the first pack. It was because of one thing. 
He is a absolute strong man. It, it had, that swim had very little to do with technique. It had about, it had to do with how strong are you? Can you muscle your way through if you need to? Mm-hmm. And people who, who, people who approach them, you're hopping the pool. They, and we go over this all the time when we do a swim analysis, like, listen, like you have to stop thinking. And this is the perfect example. If you swam enough and you were prepared enough, you should have been able to finish. Okay. You should, it, with, with a reasonable degree, um, you know, there's, there's obviously like, you know, a massive distance disparity too. Like, you know, most people probably barely even trained up to that distance to even cover some people personally, it was over like a thousand yards. It's a long time to be in the water. Right. And two loops make it even slower, right? You have to get out of the water you have to start over again. Um, it, it's just a, it's a, it was a hard swim and you had to be incredibly prepared to get through it in, in, in a, even cause especially if you're a middle to back of a pack athlete, that are, that's already looking for like a room for air or it doesn't need any room for air. There was no room for air. It just, it just wasn't. Um, and you just had like a lot of athletes when they, when they hit up the pool, they swim, their focus is just, how can I swim within the water? How can I be in the water? And that is the opposite approach for how you want to swim in an open water event. It is, I need to work on moving through the water. I need to be aggressive. I need to take the offensive I mean, we, I think the last like swimming micro goals podcast we even talked about is like when you get in the water, especially for an open water event, I think even after Ironman Wisconsin, when I, when I watched that, it was like, you need, you need to be on the offensive. You can't. And that's just a skill that, that very, very few athletes acquire because they just stay in the pool. And, And even if they get in the open water, they, they, they splish splash around. Like, you know, they hang out with their buddies and they go float for a while. And they're like, yeah, I got a little bit of open water swim in the day. Like, no, you didn't. Like you just went out on a raft and just chilled out for a little bit. You didn't do, you didn't put yourself in a situation where you, you felt like things could be problematic and you felt like what it might be like to be in a situation. And I've covered this before too. I think, I don't, I don't remember why, but or I think it was when we were coming out of, um, races being canceled, we had, had athletes who had limited to no pool time, right? Who, who didn't have any access to a pool for six to eight months. They were like, you know, I'm thinking about hopping in this race. I'm like, no, you're not. I was like, it's got nothing to do with, you know, me being, you know, some dictator. It's like, it's, it's not safe. I'm, I'm, you're not going into some 70.3 or full Ironman without having, you know, doing any swimming. You're not doing it. It's got nothing to do with your time. It's about safety. It's about being prepared. And that is one thing that I think even some, a lot of coaches totally undercount and don't address is if I don't have my athletes swimming hard enough, frequently enough, they're going to have no idea what it's like to be in that situation or to feel that, that type of anaerobic push or the fact that I can't breathe more. It's better to have them do it in the pool, right? Than not, you know, even we have our, our camps in here in Chattanooga and then in Nashville, we like, I like to put people in a bother. I like to put people mm-hmm. in a bother because it teaches you a lesson in a controlled environment of how to do things and how to figure out even the pool. Oftentimes people start with us and they're like, hey, we'll do one swim and they'll be like, well, I haven't swam like that ever because I, nobody pushes themselves, right? They just kind of get in the water and go through the thing and, and glide and swim and, and be delicate and delicate training and delicate swimming get you delicate results. And sometimes that's just not what you're looking for. When you hop into a race, you, you have to be, and even like, you know, swimming is, it's that hard because you can go hypoxic so easy and you can go anaerobic so quickly that again, going back to what I said, like you can't just coast on your bike. You can't walk like you can on the run. You're stuck, right? You have to tread water or find You have to, you have to troubleshoot and get yourself right while still moving and being at, and, and being active. You can't just, there is no active recovery in open water swimming. Like unless you want to float on your back. Oh, if you want to float on your back and it's a rolling start, who the hell knows who's going to be behind you because <laughs> yeah. you might get swam over. Like it is, it just, it, it puts people in a, in a, in a state of panic in a state of bother. And they have absolutely n- like no skill set and no practice on how to get out of it. Not just, I'm not talking about speed. I'm talking about just safely, right? You need to be able to do this safely. And I, and I would honestly encourage everybody. If you don't know how to tread water, learn. Like, and that's not the scariest. Like every athlete should know how to at least tread water for just a little bit for not long, but just for a little bit, at least a minute. You'd be shocked at how many people have no idea how to tread water and stay afloat. Really? Man, when I think back to when I started in the sport with you, we kind of got connected because of the open water training that you Mm -hmm. always used to put together. And I think about how really lucky I was to kind of stumble onto that because 
when I, we started, we had a group of probably any given day, 15 to 20 people out every three days a week at six o'clock. I mean, first of all, that was a little much, but <laughs> I'm glad I went through it because I, I think a lot of people just that just went through Florida, for example, kind of got a crash course in that. Right. You know, so now at least going forward, you can take that with you. You whenever you do a hard race like that, you can you have that in your back pocket and you know now. So now everything will seem maybe just at least mentally a little easier going in. But that but you already know that you what you have to do to be ready for. Right. So at least you're psychologically exposed to that and that's what we would do 15 20 people three days a week and uh, we would you would line us up man and you would start the slower people first and then another group and another group. we'd always end up scrumming out you know as far away from the beach at the buoy and we'd have to get through that we were rubbing shoulders swap swapping paint. paint all summer all summer every long. day you know it's like we're just screwing around swimming in the morning at the beach but we'd get in I mean, and it was so funny because I would always talk to you I'm like, are we swimming far enough? You'd be like, oh, trust me, you are. Because we would, you know, some days it would be only be like 1,800 yards total, but it would be you hard swimming. hammering it. Hard swimming with, no you know, walls, a lot of no contact, breaks. a lot of, some mornings waves, some mornings really cold water, whatever. All that stuff. And by the time we got to that mass start in Wisconsin, all of us were just not intimidated by that at all. We all started right in the front. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, you know, not that, that. You know, but most people train for a mass race start. like that, huh? From mass the center, start. mass start, and it was a little rough in the beginning. But after that, you know, you figured it out. But um, you know, so many people, including me, will go into the pool and do their hundreds or whatever, and then see that. Oh man, my last hundred was one forty one. I should be able to hold a one forty five <laughs> for the whole <laughs> day or whatever. And you just don't. It's just so apples and oranges. It's, uh, you comparing. Apples and avocados, isn't yeah, close? You know, but I, I just think we all get in that mindset where we kind of decide to turn uh, one interval into our baseline, oh, and then sure. all of a sudden. But I think that applies across the board with running and biking too. But but for swimming, it's you're, you're so right. It's it's more of this. Uh, I don't want to say survival thing, but a little bit more of a like get your head straight because. It's going to be rough out there, you know, and at the, I always talk about an Ironman swim. When I get about 500 yards from the shore, that's when my guard goes up even higher because I get, up, I get it really high in the beginning because I know, you know, shit can happen. But then the minute you start going, oh, I'm all right, I'm getting there. I'm going to cruise in. And the next thing you know, somebody's going to swim over you and then things are going to go awry and then you got to pant, you know, like so. And there's nowhere to go. Yeah. Okay. There's no, you're five, like you said, you're 500, 800 yards up. There's nowhere to go. Like yeah. you're, you're in the middle of a body of water. Like, you know, and you're, you have to know how to take care of yourself and just survive. Right. Like, and that's, and like, that's, that's obviously not every Ironman swim, but the point is that, and like you said, like going back to the days we would hold, like we did three clinics a week, you know, three swim sessions a week. And all we did, we, it was never fluff. It was, no. I, I mean, the point that, and we do this at our camps too. My point is that my point or the point of coaching and the point of those types of camps isn't to make you comfortable during the camp. The camp is to allow you to be uncomfortable and have your wits about you when things get uncomfortable and unpredictable when it matters, right? In, a, in, a, in an environment to where you're no longer in control. That's the, that's the point. Like, so, like you said, we, I'd, I'd line you guys up with the slowest people first and have them swim and have the faster people come swim on top of them and vice versa to have, to make sure you knew and had, I mean, there was even sometimes where I remember <laughs> you guys fill your goggles up with water uh, and run in and swim. So you could figure out how to troubleshoot that when you leak goggles and like in the mix in the, in the scrum, like you, you have to, in, in what, like what better time, right. To, to do that than in practice. Right. So you're comfortable. So when you get in to the water, you're like, this feels like home. Like, you know, I'm going to see something, but I'm probably seeing it already. And that's the opposite. Most people are never prepared when they walk on the beach or to get in open water. They're not prepared for what, for what may or may not happen, for how um, congested it's going to be, for how they're going to get swum over or kicked or like, it just, it's part of it. And you can protect yourself all you want and you might have access to open water, but if you just choose to swim easy and you choose to swim careful and you choose to swim, you know, just blatantly soft in the pool, then 
what what are you going to expect? Like what 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 are you going to expect when it you're going to be the it's going to be pinball, right? When you hop no matter no matter if it's a mass start or a rolling start, it's going to be a pinball effect. It's it's the same. Okay, you're surrounded by people. And I just think that that's that's one of those things where and even I think the, the day even itself like it was like 41 degrees. You know, like you signed up for Ironman Florida two years ago or, or, an, or, a, or a, you know, a year be- before that, and you're like, ah, I, I want to get a nice, easy one in for my first one. I'm going to see the, the nice, warm, you know, tempered climate of Panama City in early November. It's probably going to be perfect, like 60s, 70s, wetsuit, legal swim, you know, flat bike. And you're like, it's freezing cold, right, mm-hmm. to start the bike. They were free. It was, it was windy as well. They had a headwind for like the most of the first half. And then they t- tail one at the end. There is no, no such thing as an easy Ironman because you can, you, even like, you know, the two days before you're thinking like, oh, weather's going to be perfect. The sea is calm. You wake up and you're like, oh my God, this is a giant cluster. Like, how am I going to make it through? It's still a hundred and you're still self propelling yourself 140 miles alone. Like just say that, like that's a long Long. I think about every time I drive from from Chattanooga to Nashville, I'm like, so 140 miles to so basically an Ironman. Like I have to travel this by myself, mm-hmm. and that's how far I have to go alone, right? Other people there, but that's just an insanely. And I just, I then I think, uh, and I think Ironman, I think just society, we continue to discount the seriousness and the the mental approach that we need to have to take on such hard things because the way that it's marketed and the way that we consume things, it's like, Oh, everybody should be able to do it. You know, like it's, you know, nothing is impossible. No, it's not, not if you, you know, do what's needed. No, nothing is impossible, but it's still, you, sometimes I wake up and like today feels impossible, right? Just like a day of the week where mm-hmm. things don't go to plan. Things seem into, you know, really, really hard. Like, Life is hard. Triathlon is hard. Racing is harder. And then the more you up the distance, the harder it's going to get. And then you toss yourself in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Mother Nature doesn't give a shit. She'd be like, you know what? What I'm feeling today, I'm feeling a little bit. I'm feeling grumpy today. I'm going to let Old Man C take over, and you guys have fun. No one cares, right? You guys have to be prepared. And but also kudos. I mean, and again, kudos to everyone who not just made it through, but it's like it's, it was just a super. Super tough day, and another just reason why you can't. I hope you weren't on track, Alk, uh, because because you yeah. were. You know, and I had multiple athletes that I work with, and a, and a friend of mine. It was like, I'm so glad I didn't have my watch on the swim, because I did. I would have not wanted to see how far back I was from my goal. Because mm-hmm. ain't none of ya. What do you been on pace for? Whatever you did in tri calc, you'd have been twenty minutes slower, and you'd been like, there goes my day. Right. Yeah. Immensely, you would have been toast, right? Or done something stupid on the bike to like try to catch up time. So I think people who didn't wear their watch and had no idea, you even saw on like the pro's face, the first ones came out of the water, they're like looking behind. They're like, is anybody else with me? Where am I? Like, because like, usually they all know because the water's fighting. You can tell who's, who's in front of you, who's behind you, straight shot. I think they kind of looked at their, the first two guys looked at their watch and they were like, this is slow. And they, they looked and they waited for like, they all went, no one was trying to leave. It was like, let's stick together on this one. <laughs> let's see if we can make it through. It was fascinating to watch, but it just shows you like how hard, how hard uh, the day was in general. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times um, it's kind of back on the mass start thing, but when, when you go into something, you know, this difficult and sort of try to figure out ways to, make it easier or you know what I mean? Like just set up, like I'm going to start way in the back just because it's, it's easier and it might, you know, safe or not as many people around. I won't feel as rushed, but I don't think you can pre-plan that kind of stuff because I think you need to get your mindset in, like you said, the aggressive sort of mentality from the get go, because what you're doing is not a fluffy little walk through the park and you can just, you can start, you know, a hundred people from the last person in line and still like that, you're going to have a now, like somebody's going to be creeping on you the whole swim. You know, it's just your luck, right? You know, that you want to pick a safe spot and, and find a nice little open area to swim in. And, and somebody for whatever reason is going to be like your swim twin, swim twin, the, the mm-hmm. magnet that's just right on you the whole day. But <clears throat> so you can't plan for that is what, what I'm saying. And that's why <clears throat> even in a mass start, Wisconsin people would always want to be, 
well, it's just, it's not safe or what, because, but no, just start out to the wide side or in the back. That was what I would always say. You're going to start, you know, 30 yards behind the start line. You're losing 30 yards worth of time. And, and like, are you worried about time at that point? But I just think it's so important <clears throat> to get in a mindset where you know it's going to be hard make it in your mind even seem a little harder so then it becomes easier yeah, rather you know than what's safe being to, prepared yeah because if you know how you know how it is you walk in unprepared for something and ah, i'm just gonna cruise it and then it starts getting ugly and then you gotta really dig deep and if you don't dig deep you're gonna you know start crying and you start crying no i didn't that's just that's listen like and that that's like some of the biggest life lessons you know in terms of also like if you're an athlete that didn't finish it's just, a, it was a rough day. Is it, I mean, yes, you could prepare for a lot of it, but some of us, you couldn't, you know, like no one told you it was going to be, you know, 6,000 yards. No one told you it was going to be, you know, sometimes you just don't make it, you know, and that's, I think there's a great life lesson there too, is, just, you know, you can't, you can't predict things and you can't have, and I honestly can't imagine like if you had all of your hopes and dreams and, and your identity for the last two years wrapped up in this one race and you didn't make it out of the swim, mm. you know, and yeah, the, know. the, 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 the sensitivity and, and saltiness, if you will, to that issue, um, I'm sure is a lot, you know, it, but in, like I said, um, at, and if you made it out, it was one of the hardest swims you're probably ever going to have to do. Um, and it'll be an experience, but also I think, you know, it teaches, uh, teaches us a lesson, you know, to, you can't, you can't get anything for granted ever. You can't take anything for granted and you, you have to be prepared and you have to be prepared for things to go poorly. And not to be, and you just have to grit it out. Like, you know, there's most of the athletes that, I, that I've heard back from where it was like, it wasn't about a PR day. It wasn't about going fast. It was about just grit, mm -hmm. just making it through. The swim was ugly. The bike was frustrating. You know, it was like, it wasn't, you know, and that's how oftentimes we see, you know, oh, this is going to go great. We have these expectations of the environment or the, the atmosphere in which things are going to happen. You're like, oh, it's going to work out. It's going to go perfect and smooth and, very little drama and it's going to be great. And then all of a sudden it hits the fan. And you're like, Oh my God, I wasn't, I just got it. You just got to figure it out. And I think that's a, such a great lesson that we can have these expectations and time goals and results and that people attach themselves to weeks and months out from a race. And then you get in the water for 30 seconds. You're like, well, there it goes. You know, and you're like, think mm -hmm. about how much there it goes, how it goes. Like you think about how much stock you put, into that and for how long and how deep that went for you to not have it. And that's why it's just, it's so great to not have those kind of expectations, expectations, but to practice things in, and to instill within yourself, the perspective that gives you, that says like, you know, this is just about it's an effort. It's about me. It's about you being resilient. I just got to get through it because again, like, you know, sometimes I give them a hard time. It's like, oh, it wasn't my best workout of the day, but it's not one of my best workout. I was like, yeah, cause there's one of them. Literally one of the thousands. There's one best workout, one worse, the rest are in the middle. Mm -hmm. We have, but we have these, these illusions of grandeur that things are going to go so perfectly. Like the world gives a crap that we choose to do triathlon as a hobby that oh, it's going to go pretty smooth. Like no, no one, literally no one cares, right? Literally no one cares. The world doesn't care. Mother nature doesn't care. No one cares except for like four or five people. And <laughs> so to think that like the world is going to cater to, that's how life is. Like, you know, you, but I'm also a huge believer in, you know, you can ask for things that you want, but life usually gives you what you need. Um, and oftentimes we want things that are easy. And oftentimes life's like, mm, you don't need anything easy right now. What you need is something hard. Mm. Um, and, and I just think it, it's one of those moments that I hope hopefully teaches those that whether you DNF or didn't DNF, like most of us get what we need, even we don't want it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's... Um, it's a hard lesson, I think, for every athlete and every person, you know, learn and to recognize that and, and to, but to be able to just make, you know, just, just make it through the day, you know, and sometimes that's like, we say that in terms of Ironman, like the races that are hard and hilly and, and, and are super hot or super windy and storms and, and a race like Florida, where it's just about making it through the day, man, sometimes I find myself saying like once a week, I'm like, all right, dude, just make it through the day. And it's again, like there's a million different you know, analogies you can make between life and Iron Man, but life always gives you what you need, man. And, and I think, I think it's a way for us to kind of hopefully refocus as you go into the off season, but be proud of yourself too. Like if you made it and you finished it, 
that's hang that one on your hat because it's a tough one and hopefully learn a lesson to propel you forward for the next time again but kudos to, to everybody who who got out there and gave it their all and and especially to those who who you know made it through and got to the finish line mm-hmm. i gotta do an analogy here you do it <clears throat> yeah the uh back to my football team the badgers real quick uh-huh. um you know they have a really good defense and the biggest problem we had at the beginning of the year was the, the throwing pick sixes. So they we were getting beat by, but it wasn't because of our defense. And they have a lot of gritty guys, and they they substitute in and out. It's kind of next man up. That's always been their mentality. And who's going to take over? Yeah, somebody got hurt. So what? We got to get. And you know how they have all those defensive, like the turnover chains and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And we were making fun of that. And I th- I think it's kind As of you silly. should yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed this, but they, the Wisconsin guys about two weeks ago, one of the guys went into a, a Goodwill and he bought a trucker cap with a, a blank, like white front on it. You got a tr- you got a turnover trucker? A, no, a red hat. Yeah. Well, no, um, it's got a red brim and a white face. Mm-hmm. And the guy took a Sharpie and wrote on there the grit factory. And that's what they use now. Like if there's turnover, they do to wear the like a factory. beat up trucker hat I with like a sharp that. sharpie written on it. But anyway, I the the lesson that you learn going through that. I keep going back to this. You know, I had the, one of my hardest races was that cold one in Knoxville, and then Wisconsin, the first one. Those are like wake up calls, big time, right? So what I try to do always in training is remember that feeling, you know, and when it pops up, I don't try to, I don't want every training run or ride to go perfectly, but when you get into that situation, it's like, how are you going to, you know, brand that in your brain, that grit, you know, like, like practice getting through that. And I think that's what the, the beauty of a race like this is. And when you get through it, you know, now, you know, it's, we talk about how the pain of an Ironman marathon hits you and then we forget it. So what you just went through in Florida with that swim, do not forget that and always keep that in mind when you're training because those are the parallels that you have to kind of connect in your brain and really work at. And we always talk about how do I work, you know, and get better form in the pool and be, but it's about getting stronger and it's about, about getting more resilient and it's about pushing through things like that. And I just think you can't practice that enough, you know, because that's the stuff you know, you, you, you go into it thinking all right, every race that you do from now on, you're going to be like, all right, the swim is going to be like Ironman Florida. And then maybe it's easy if you're mentally in that space where you're going to be prepared to go through hell. But then maybe it isn't. It's like, oh, well, that's a good bonus. But don't like let your guard down just because, you know, you might see, you know, the great example is the race I just did Chattanooga. That mm-hmm. swim was just butter smooth man butter i never smooth. you know it was a big wide river and I, nothing happened but i'm sure people had their problems out there you just never know you know and if, if it hadn't have been a wetsuit swim and maybe if the current was super slow that could have been a nightmare of a swim for a lot of people because they weren't ready for it but what happens is you get lucky that day and you know don't take it for granted just you know use it and then hopefully that can make give you a better bike and run or whatever. But that's the huge thing that I think people probably discount or haven't like maybe this is a good reminder that even though we say it, I feel like all the time, seventy point three in Ironman racing is all about energy expenditure. Mm-hmm. And the moment you start using excess excess energy at the beginning of the race, the more your bike and your run are going to suffer and deteriorate because you're using up energy and effort. And that was what you saw. On on the um, on the swim, people out there for an hour and forty five, two hours, two fifteen. Nobody to, had a training swim that hard. Up to no, up to like two, like you. So a lot of people in the water for 40, 45 minutes longer, right? Not just you know longer as in like ah, it's just smooth. The, the course is long, I'm just floating down. You know the Mississippi over here. It's like forty five minutes of in. in a total body workout trying to get to shore to make the cutoff that affected the whole rest of your day. 
It affected your energy levels and your ability to produce the same level of effort and power on the bike. Probably affected a lot of people. I mean, I, I read about a lot of people who dropped out with like seasickness, like off the, because their stomach was just so they took in so much salt water or they had salmon the night before or they or that's the motion of the ocean. They were just so off. They, they pulled out of the race. And, and obviously, if, if your swim is going to be that much affected, then to your bike and then to your run, you're behind the eight ball the minute, but probably before you got to the fifth buoy. And again, like the run always gets blamed for everything. When the run is rarely the problem, the run, it's usually you didn't swim enough, you didn't pace well enough, and your nutrition was crap. Always look to those things first before you start to criticize your run. I got to do more track work. I got to do some, you know, 25, 30 milers. How about you look to your swim, right? So how about you look to your bike and how about you look at your nutrition? Because running, and again, running always gets the bad rep because it's the last thing you do. It's when you're going to walk. It's when you're going to, you're chasing a time. It's, it's how you cross the finish line. I guarantee you, again, if it was reversed and you did run, bike, swim, people take their swim a lot more seriously because they're going to they're gonna hop in the water, do a total body workout, and they've already been super fatigued from the, the run and the bike. Just take it seriously, the whole thing. All three, and I know there's a coach out there who totally – poo-poo on the swim that it's short you don't need to take it that seriously and we don't need to swim that much well you're doing a gigantic disservice to your athlete and also the ability to perform up to their level in the bike and on the run um i've ranted my way through this podcast <laughs> uh and i feel like i need to cut it short because i, I feel i feel like i'm i think i went out too hard too early yeah well, i didn't I usually a negative split but i went out hot on this one and i think i'm paying the price yeah I think you're right, actually. Think about how hungry you would have been if you did that swim and training and just kind of went to work or something. Dude, I, you, you wouldn't be able to fit in your wetsuit. <laughs> come, come game day, you'd have, you'd have hit up Costco and had That's all the snacks. Saying. And you'd, you'd have been so, you, so hungry. Yeah, you get out of that swim and you could have probably Starving. ate the biggest breakfast, you know, that uh, Cracker Barrel ever put oh, together in their life. Fresh some Cracker Cracker Barrel. And then, but no, you're just going to get on the bike and eat a goo. Right, while, we, while pedaling. <laughs> right, it's like pedaling. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, I mean, right? And I think another thing that people probably didn't think, I said I was done. Uh, they probably didn't think about it, as I mentioned to someone else, is like keeping your body warm creates the need for more calories because your body's working that much harder, not just because you're, I don't know, you're pedaling and you're probably going into your bike now totally fasted because you didn't, you you waited to get in the water for 45 minutes and you were in the water for two hours. Oh, okay, I'm kind of hungry and need to fuel and you wonder why your bike suffered, Right. And, but you also, because your body's tr- working its butt off to just stay warm, burning more calories and working even harder. Like those are all the things that you need to do. So yeah, you were probably starving. You needed some trunk cookies. <laughs> yeah. Well. It should have been an aid station at mile two. <laughs> trunk cookies. Pull on over. Maybe we'll go to Ironman Florida next year and we'll pull over and open up the trunk for trunk cookies. See how many people stop. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that is if we make it down there with any of them left in the trunk. Yeah, come on. I mean, no, it's both, true. It's both true. I'm weak. Um, we, we've all got our we've all got our uh, our kryptonite our cook our cookie kryptonite. That's it. That's all I got for today. Yeah, what you want to get in the questions? No, no. <laughs> Listen, we got questions. We're gonna we're gonna record it tomorrow. Release on Thursdays. We'll be at Run Camp. We'll be out of the office the rest of the week. As always, we love you. We appreciate you. Get back in the saddle. Get your ass in the pool. And uh, if you want to check out things on our website, c 26 triathloncom Again, it's our one stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. Um, and hey. If you want to address your swim, now's the time. Come in for some analysis. Get prepared. Have a great rest of the year. Uh, if you want info on how to schedule that, uh, reach out to Summer at c26operations at gmail.com. She'll get you set up. That's it. If you need anything from Mike or have questions about the club, he's at crushingiron at gmail.com. If you want to get a hold of me and tell me how wrong I am about rolling starts, I'm at c26coach at gmail.com. Uh, I tell you, you got me nervous. I'm, I'm thinking about going to swim here. Good. Good. Just the pool. <laughs> See you, dude. Run camp. See you.